Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Positions is conceived as a series of conversations by the Department of Architecture at the GSD. The purpose of the series is not only to share discourse from within our school, but also to occasion a broader reflection on the positions taken by players on the field of contemporary architecture. So our hope is to unfold the complexity of relations and metaphors to make them explicit inviting faculty and guests to voice where they stand and what's on their mind. So today, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you today uh, Jermaine Barnes, Elizabeth Cristoforetti, Beth Whitaker. I'm just going to give you a little bit. I, I've worked this morning to condense their multi-page bios into one paragraph each of 150 words. Um, Jermaine Barnes is a design critic here with us. He's been teaching with us for the last several weeks. Um, and his research and design practice investigates the connection between architecture and identity. Mining architecture's social and political agency, he examines how the built environment influences black domesticity. Currently, he's an associate professor and director of the Community Housing Identity Lab at the University of Miami School of Architecture. He is the 2021 Harvard GSD Wheelwright Prize winner, Rome Prize Fellow, and winner of the ARC League Prize. His design and research contributions have been published and exhibited in several international institutions, most notably the Museum of Modern Art, Pinup Magazine, the Graham Foundation, the New York Times, Architect Magazine, Design Miami and Art Basel, uh, the Swiss Institute, Metropolis Magazine, Curbed and the National Museum of African American History, where he was identified as one of the future designers on the rise. Elizabeth Cristoforetti is an assistant professor in practice at the GSD and principal of Supernormal, a design studio based in Cambridge. Her teaching and research focus on emerging modes of design practice, exploring design methods, theories, and the technological building blocks that enable design practice to better confront the imperatives of our time, such as artificial intelligence and market-driven urbanism. Her research group within the Laboratory for Design Technologies aims to uncover the potentials for scalable systems of design by daylighting, operating upon, and designing new socio-technical systems, design that is dependent upon a combination of social and technological processes and collaboration between them. Her design practice, research, and teaching explore the cultural implications of large data sets, human-machine collaboration, and scalable systems of design. Elizabeth works, Elizabeth work joins a perspective of radical pragmatism with a deep value for the potential of design imagination, and she is also curator of the incredible exhibit outside our artificial nature, just an, you know, really incredible for its heterogeneity of, of different efforts uh, conducted with the Center for Green Buildings and Cities. Beth Whitaker is an associate professor in practice of architecture here at the GSD. She's been teaching in the core since 2009 and was the lead faculty in architecture in the Design Discovery Summer Program from 2011 to 2015. Beth is a founder and principal of Merge Architects based in Boston since 2003. Her work at Merge develops contemporary craft and transforming typologies, particularly in housing, and I think you should all uh, take a strong look at that um, repertoire. The work of Merge has been widely published and has received multiple awards, including 28 AIA and BSA awards. Um, Beth is the recipient of the AIA Young Architects Award, Architectural Records Design Vanguard, the ARC League of New York Emerging Voices Award, and ARC Records 2017 Women in Architecture Next Gen Leader Award. She is currently serving as a member of the Industry Advisory Group uh, for the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Overseas Building Operations, advising on U.S. architectural projects throughout the world. Beth was recently nominated for election to the AIA College of Fellows, the FAIA that is, the American Institute of Architects' highest honor for contributions to the profession. Please join me in welcoming these wonderful three. Thanks, Grace. Is this, is this on? Yeah, we're good? Okay. All right, so uh, this is such a cool trio, really excited to be here. We don't know, like the last couple, because I listened in, how this will land <laughs> as a trio. Um, but we are each going to show a past, present, and future project, and of course talk about what influenced kind of the beginning of that. Um, 
so, yeah. So my practice, I've been teaching here for um, quite a while in core, and I have been teaching the last few years, maybe like five or six in housing. And so when Grace and Andrew reached out and said, okay, positions, I thought maybe the best way to talk about the positions of my work emerges through three housing projects, because it's I think it's just clearer. But we are a lot more than housing. I don't know if people know this, but I would say half of our work is actually about the inside. We do a ton of interiors. Um, and I think in terms of positionally, we are super interested in craft and assembly and how to put things together and different material mixes, which I think does transcend into our housing projects. So I think there's a relevance there. And then we do a lot of buildings. <laughs> Most of them are housing. Um, so really fast. Past, um, and I'm looking at the time. By the way, the first pass is not going to be five minutes. It's going to be to set it up and do a pass project <laughs> might be eight. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about type. Uh, and of course, housing is all about type. And the project that like blew my mind, um, I don't know, like 18 or so years ago, was Narcomfin, which probably a lot of you know it pretty well. Um, it is in Moscow. It was done in the late 20s, 1930, I think it was finished by Mosiah Ginsburg. Um, it looks super dry, and it's anything but um, from the constructivist um, architectural movement. It is very much about the industrial kind of machine, um, buttoned up uh, aesthetic. But it is a bar building that is absolutely fascinating in section. Um, that, I don't have a pointer, I just realized. <laughs> That little yellow box um, screen left is, uh, there's this whole collective living, communal living um, agenda to this project, which is not what I'm here to talk about today. And that was where they had a lot of communal amenity spaces. But more importantly for today is to talk about the section and how fascinating it is to pack in different unit types with this hyper-efficiency, which is what housing is all about. Um, and how to do it in a really clever way and how to affect a kind of social ecology um, depending on the way that you do it. And so the corridor uh, was extremely important, a super wide corridor um, kind of implies a certain kind of social uh, space and dynamic. And then the section, um, which was so brilliant, uh, it's a section that on one side of the building reads as three stories on the other six. So that alone I find really interesting. Um, out of six floors, only two required a common corridor, and the rest is all living space. So for those of you that do housing, that is smart, smart, smart. Um, and it made for these really um, fascinating unit types. So only two corridors, two types he calls the K-type and the F-type. One, the green one is a simple maisonette. The purple and the orange have this kind of side-by-side -side entry, and you walk down into the purple one, you walk up into the orange one. And so there, again, there's this hyper-efficiency with section. The two elevations, which one side reads as six, the other as three stories, um, and so on and so forth. Um, because I don't have a pointer, it's going to be hard to walk you through this, and I don't have time. But the orange entry on the right side, you go down to the lower floor, which is on the left. And on the left side of the orange, you go up. And so it's this whole twisted section. So that kind of project, I think, is what launched how we started to think about our work at Merge when we were met with these developer clients that asked for um, the world in a tiny site and footprint, and how would we pull it off. And so there's a whole lineage of this. Of course, the Unite Corp um, decades later, um, and how these uh, unit types and assemblies start to represent themselves as a tectonic on the exterior um, is something we talk about in the office all the time. Um, and so, and then fast forward to the 90s, MBRDV, the Wazoko project, how the unit is kind of pushed out literally from the facade and the kind of, I would say, the combination of the micro and the macro of the cube and the pixel as a kind of tectonic in architecture. Um, feels very much akin to the Narconfit in a weird kind of contemporary way. Um, so those projects are the past for us, I would say, um, and the things that we looked at at the beginning of the housing projects. The one I'm about to show you, I think we did um, 10 years ago, and it was only our second housing project. Um, 
And just one slide on this, assembly and craft back to the interior. So we were cutting our teeth for a decade on this kind of stuff, um, which is interiors where we were treating them more like an, uh, kind of like an installation and ideas about simple materials like pegs and cotton straps and making um, really interesting surfaces and interior environments and how that would then translate as we scaled up into architecture and buildings and thermal envelopes. Um, so the first uh, past project, which is about um, called Marginal 1.0, this is in East Boston. We've done three uh, housing projects on this street now. So we have a 1.0, a 2.0, and a 3.0. <laughs> Um, I'm going to show you three in the present. And so context for us is really important. We're always trying to, we, we always have to get these approved through neighborhood processes. And so there is a narrative, even if it's in-house, in this one is very much explicit um, through the approval processes. And so context and how to think of it in a contemporary way and talk about it in this way with the neighborhood, for example, in the city is really important. This is a site adjacent to an old shipyard um, right on the edge of it, and that space in between those triple-deckers and that warehouse type is our site. We, we took down that low-rise garage. And so it was this funky um, edge condition to the shipyard industrial and then the classic triple-decker, which is everywhere in the Boston area. And how to think of what the type of project and building this should be. We had to build it to the inch, literally in section, because we had a parking, we couldn't go below to the water table, we had a height that we couldn't expand upon, zoning envelope, all that. And the client wanted um, nine units with all water views. Well, they didn't fit. And so we really looked at, this is the relationship with the water. We looked at a kind of unit type, which we thought of the floor through tube, living on the front, sleeping on the back. But it's the US, and we need two means of egress. So somehow we have to cross grain through it with a common corridor and two stairs on either side. So without getting too in the weeds, which I already am, um, the idea was this, that there were these stacked tubes, the views out to the water, carved out for the parking, went down about four feet to the water table, and then had one out of the whole section had one common corridor, which was in the kind of what I call this two and a half floor, um, which is that little green box. And that uh, allowed for this to work. Um, it also provided for this really interesting mezzanine unit within section. Zoning, you're only allowed to do a three-story building, but we snuck in a fourth floor in the middle of the section and no one was the wiser. Um, and you know, then layered it with this idea of assembly that we had from our in interior projects in this kind of interest in craft. Um, and so basically that's the type. Uh, again, only two means of egress on the ground floor, which is the lower level. Um, the private entries on the left side and the right side to the two units on the left, two units on the right, and then the common corridor on the two and a half floor, which also accessed um, the top floor flat units. So a series of these tube units that represented as both um, mezzanines and the flat. And so again, sandwiching in a fourth floor, whoops, um, in the middle, kind of sneakily. And so what would have been a pretty uh, restricted ceiling height um, worked because it opened up to this voluminous one and a half story living space um, in that mezzanine section. So you have these kind of catwalk spatial conditions um, and then a view out to the water. This is a mirrored image. So I'll go really fast and then the flats on the roof plane and then the view off the roof. And so it was a really simple box um, with views out to the water and this idea about the craft and assembly with the facade, with these um, more playful uh, varying um, shaped uh, steel frames with these steel gusset plates where we kind of shrink wrap this steel mesh over it, which related back to the chain link facade that we found all over the neighborhood. Um, and then found somebody to actually sew it on uh, to the facade. And voila. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, my position is kind of all over the place. So I'll just kind of just start with there. Uh, I feel like I'm allowed to have multiple positions. I'm not a stationary person. So the stuff you're going to see is also not stationary. Uh, 
So we'll sort of take this as sort of a, a journey of practice instead. So uh, that's a line from a J. Cole song, which I absolutely love. Uh, like, I try to keep things close to the vest and don't tell people what's going on until either I win or if I lost. So that way nobody will ask me if you won or not. So it's kind of where that comes from. Um, but I want to start with the Richard Neutra VDL Research House. Uh, so I lived in Los Angeles. Um, my first job out of grad school, I spent the entire summer at this house. Um, I worked for a very famous French artist named Xavier Veillon. Um, he has quite a few permanent works in front of places like the Centre Pompidou, uh, MoMA. Um, he has like massive structures and everything. And he wanted to do an installation at the Neutra VDL house. And I was his lead assistant because he didn't know how to do any 3D modeling. So um, it was my job to turn all of his sketches into everything in Rhino. And at the same time, I was working for another French architect named um, Francois Perrine, uh, who passed away from um, brain cancer. But his practice was more halfway between a building and installation. So he's very famous for this project called the Skateboard House. Um, and so in my mind, it was always, oh, wait a minute. I don't have to just design Walgreens for the rest of my life. Like, <laughs> I can just go ahead and do more interesting or stuff. Or ever. Or ever, <laughs> right? Um, so this is Richard Neutra on the roof. Uh, again, it's really cool to be able to spend the entire summer at one of the most iconic houses in Silver Lake, uh, which is, you know, a part of the Los Angeles modernist movement. Um, so what it looks like in section. Kind of want to show you all some architectural drawings because uh, Beth finished hers first, and I was like, I gotta draw, I gotta show sections <laughs> and elevations. It's like, all right, <laughs> let me go find these and put these in, put these in the presentation. Then I'll just give y'all just straight first. photos and be done. Um, that's Xavier on on screen. That's him. You're looking, like whatever drawings. Yeah, looking, <laughs> looking looking very disheveled, but uh, that is him. He used to make everything by hand. That's him, like literally carving the foam. And it was my job to like do a lot of this stuff too. So I got very hands-on experience and it really allowed me to see sort of a uh, boundary breaking between just doing one type of thing within practice. In the end, we made all of these uh, artistic sculptures. So you see some on the ground um, within the space sort of activated the entire um, location of the home. The project was called Architect Tones. Um, this is like a mobile that he did. And this is also, uh, ironically, I know this is being recorded, so I'm not gonna say everything, but um, <laughs> this is also where I learned about authorship and, and uh, the role of the person who gets the project versus the role of the person who does a lot of the labor. <laughs> uh, if you know what I mean, when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Um, this is on the top of the roof. It just kind of swing through this. And it was an amazing experience uh, where every single day I get to leave my apartment, go here and serve like at nine o'clock in the morning, chill here until five o'clock and then go home. Um, it wasn't really a job, but it was a job. Like I got paid for it, which is incredible. And then this is actually mm -hmm. the, uh, this is the next project. He did like three or four of these. This is at, um, why can't I think of his name? Uh, very famous, he goes to all the Laker games. Um, why can't I think of his name right now? He wears the cowboy hat. It is, oh my God. Goldstein. Go, Sheets Goldstein residence. Yes, so this is at the <laughs> Sheets Goldstein residence. He did another installation there. Um, we did some work there and then <laughs> We also got to run around the Hollywood Hills and they allowed him to just go into people's case study houses and just like fill it with smoke and stuff. And just like, I was like, wait a minute, you're telling me I can go around to some very fancy locations. I get to just walk into people's houses. I get to drink Cristal and this is gonna be my life. That is also true. Everything we did, the French consulate paid for. So fresh out of school, I got to drink Cristal and drink, like eat the most fancy pastries. And I was like, everything's downhill from it's here. It's not like that when you do housing. It ain't. <laughs> so when I finished this, I was like, every job has to hold up to this. And I've been keeping that same standard. So sometimes when I go to events and they have a little catering, I look and I put my nose up at the little chicken skewers. I'm like, this is, this is what we're doing here. No champagne, whatever. So that's sort of the project that, that really uh, solidified um, how I wanted to practice. And the crazy thing is when I was working on this uh, project, so quick slight detour, um, I studied French from kindergarten through 12th grade because uh, I have a tiger mom who's like, you need to know this stuff. And for some reason she thought French was a really cool language, even though I wanted to study Mandarin. And she's like, no, you're gonna study French instead. Came in handy when I worked for a French person. Um, and one of his good friends was John Nouvelle. So he really enjoyed working with me for the summer. He's like, would you like to move to Paris and work in John Nouvelle's office? 
I'm like, yo, this is why I'm doing this. This is incredible. Call home, mom, dad. All those times I hated you all, it paid off. I'm going to Paris. <laughs> and then a couple weeks later, uh, Jennifer Bonner, Christian Stainer, and myself found out we won this project in South Florida. And I had to choose move to Opelika, Florida, or move to Paris. And my parents were like, well, obviously you're moving to Paris, right? And I was like, ah, <laughs> tricked you, I'm going to Miami. <laughs> And I ended up in this weird place called Opalaka, which is in Miami-Dade. It has the largest collection of Moorish revival architecture in the Western Hemisphere. Also, the full name of the city is Opatishawakalaka because it is a seminal name that is a real thing. And again, my parents were like, and you moved here? And you could have moved to Paris? Like, <laughs> we know we raised you better than this. I was like, no, you know, I get to do work, and I get to do work that's somewhere between architecture, public art installation, but also through a lens of helping people. And that was ultimately my position. Like, how can I do work that actually helps people? And so the first thing we did was this huge park. Um, we didn't own any of this land, being totally honest with you. We kind of just took it. We were just like, you know what? Nothing's been here. If somebody got a problem, they could just come find us. And just, we would just, you know, it is what it is. And I live right down the street, because part of the proposal was that I would move to this community to actually be there on the ground, as opposed to trying to parachute in, parachute out. Um, so what that car is, they, the, the city gifted us that one little small parcel, but the other four, we just took. It was like, better to ask for forgiveness and permission. I live by that. Um, one of the cool things working with communities is that when you do one thing and you build up trust, they want more and they get a bit more uh, rambunctious about wanting more, which I kind of love. It's like, hey, what are you doing next, kid? So we went and we got this warehouse, very nondescript, used to be a roofing company, and we turned it into an art gallery and offices. And the way we fund it is if you live in Opalaka, you get to use the space for free. If you don't live, Opa, if you don't live in Opalaka, you pay $1,000 an hour. So they subsidize the place for the people that actually live there. Uh, this is what the outside of it looks like. Again, very nondescript. Uh, then we resurfaced the entire front with a lot of Morris Revival. The cool thing about this is if you guys have ever heard the name Ola Lake and Jefus, who just won the Silver Lion at the Venice Biennale of 2023, this is the first ever public art project he ever did because I saw some work in Chicago and then commissioned him to do the outside of the building while I was design architect for the inside. Um, it's a food desert. There's not enough access to fresh food in the, the city. So we walked around and we polled everyone and then we actually designed an entire community farm behind the place. So it became this huge, massive development. Um, which really sort of put me on a trajectory of someone that does grassroots community-oriented work. And all of this I completed by the age of 31. Mm -hmm. So we'll pause there. <laughs> Ask me this thing. My career has been the opposite. There is no crystal for me. Um, so I, I, um, I thought it would be helpful to put a few things down here. Um, I, I, you know, we're all obviously shaped by the circumstances of our time, Paris, Miami, so on and so forth. I came here and I graduated into the recession uh, and there was no work. Um, and so uh, uh, I also kind of came to the party late. Um, I, I, was in, um, I was in art school and theories of religion and I dropped out and I didn't know what I was doing and, and I ended up here, which was, which was wonderful. Um, but the, the early, for me, the strong things that started and that have formed my position are very much these sort of very, very simple pieces of, of art, Maine realism. Um, I went to, to college in Maine, and it was these super quiet interiors, these tiny little things that, um, you know, are like windows onto the entire world. You know, it's, it, it's very, very small and yet in, enormous and vast and, and calm. Um, and, and at the same time, looking at Louise Bourgeois um, and thinking about architecture in a way as a, as, a, as a system, as a sort of social infrastructure, as something that um, both limits the capacity for us to do things in the world, but also expands it um, and, and creates our identity. And this ultimately led me to, uh, to uh, Aldo Rossi. I, I, you know, I, I, I was looking at his drawings and paintings, actually, not as much his architecture. Um, but ultimately, this is what I, I, I've decided to, to show is, for me, something that was quite formative. Um, it, uh, his work is, you know, as you all know, I'm sure you're very familiar, um, a, a kind of, um, there's a timelessness, you know, to it. This, this way of layering this, um, this sort of 
muteness that seems like it could be from any moment, um, the, 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 um, the inevitable urbanism of it, the, the possibility of, of framing spaces between buildings, of the type forms, um, these, these are things that I, I find incredibly enduring and it, it just doesn't get old for me. Uh, and, and and it leads, in my practice, to a kind of skipping over also of the middle scale. Um, I, I often find myself being very comfortable at the scale of the room or the fragment or the unit and certainly of the aggregation of these things together into urbanism. Um, but I have really struggled, to be totally honest with you, with the building. And I will tell you why. Um, I think that it has something to do with market-driven urbanism. Um, I, fi I find myself very challenged by it. Um, as I mentioned, I graduated into the recession. Um, and, and at that point, it was, it was actually quite exciting because we were determining our own, you know, there wasn't any normal work. Um, so we did things like design infrastructure in Iraq or, uh, I don't know, teach, right? These are the things we were doing. Uh, and, and eventually I, I got a job and, uh, and, and did a lot of public work. Um, then the housing market came back uh, and suddenly it was all over and the only thing we could possibly do was developer-driven housing, which in many cases was great um, and in some cases not so much. Um, it, it, it created a particular kind of thing. So. What I'm going to show is actually, I, I, and it's funny, I was like, what am I going to show for a past project? What was really formative? It's like, actually, this was very formative. This is so damaging that it was formative. It's actually a huge failure. Um, this is the, like, this is how I started my career, and it was an enormous failure. So that's what I'm going to start with is my formative thing here, my past. Um, South Boston, I've ended up doing a whole lot of work in South Boston, as I know Beth has as well. Um, and uh, th this was the site. It was these, this little uh, white building in the middle and then the semi-tall one to the left. And I had designed this lovely little background building. It was very rational and it was, you know, it was kind of doing all the things that a nice housing project should do. And I plugged it in. Yes, it fits. It all works. It's good. Um, and then I, and, and I, for some reason, I was in charge of this whole project. I'd never done any architecture before. This was the first time I was in charge of a building. And, um, and uh, I didn't realize that, uh, that the market shapes things. And I didn't realize that the public process was a big deal. And so by um, a thousand and two tiny little nudges, the thing turned into to this on the right, which I hate. <laughs> and... I'm, I'm very sad about it. Um, and you know, it's, it's this kind of like 18 buildings all in one, which I guess could be good, but I didn't feel excited about it. And to make matters worse, um, the building went up right next to it and then copied it. And so now I, we've scaled. <laughs> We've scaled this, this accidentally designed building that, that was designed, I swear to God, by a spreadsheet and market for research. Um, and so, so I couldn't even find plans for this anymore. Um, I, I've hidden them so deeply, so I had to take Google Street Views, which somehow seems appropriate. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so, so, so that's it, and, and you can see it, <laughs> the, the, the little red outline there. It was actually like a, it was like a very good plan, if I do say so myself. Single loaded corridor, had some very smart little units, um, but it was just, you know, oh. I had no idea you worked on that project. Oh, that project Beth. was great before the one next to it went up, because you could see the courtyards coming over the, the bridge. The courtyards were good, but do you see what they did to the courtyards? Do you see yeah, that? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm glad this is cathartic. My damage. It's like a therapy <laughs> session, you guys. You know Jennifer Bonner lived there. Yes, I know, I know, oh, yeah. I know. That's right, <laughs> she did. OK, I'm going I'm to try and go. Just saying. <laughs> this is a good plan. <laughs> OK, I'm going to go faster. Um, present, which is present-ish. Um, it was a few years ago, but it feels like present work that we've been doing uh, over the last few years, which is this sort of thing, which is um, everything I was talking about before, but in terms of context, it isn't always about the triple-decker or the whatever kind of housing project adjacent, but also about the elements. Um, we went through many, 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 this is in Roxbury, many, many, many um, uh, neighborhood meetings, and they were all about this Bow Bay 
uh, window and figure, which is gorgeous, but we just were not doing that. And so we had this contemporary interpretation of the bay, which got it through. This is um, some a project we did in Williamstown where we're riffing off of um, old mill buildings, which were on the same site, old farmhouse cladding systems, um, and so on and so forth. This is in, another one in East Boston, different street, um, these old industrial warehouse buildings. And so, and then in Detroit, the fabric of a particular neighborhood, which gets me to this project, which is marginal, what we're calling 3.0, which is the one a few doors down from the one I showed you at the beginning. And so this was very much about um, being flanked by triple deckers yet again. But we had, um, at this point, we had uh, two other projects to the left, one and two that we had already built. So it, it's so funny. We did not coordinate this, but the fact that you said you didn't like that building and then somebody built something because they were riffing off of your context, right? We got to um, be, be kind of motivated by the context that we had already built. <laughs> so we were trying, and hopefully there, there's two little townhouses, I'm sorry, um, triple deckers that are holdouts that were at merge, hoping we get to develop ourselves someday. Um, and so this site was really tricky, uh, different than 1.0. Um, because it's even narrower and it's a lot deeper, which makes it hard or even harder. Uh, but, you know, we were learning about unit types and taking it really seriously um, and how we would do kind of invent on these typologies. And we had to in this case. It was only seven units, but nonetheless only two fit on the street. Same water views, so those would be like the units. But how do we fit five behind it that aren't awful? Um, and how do we deal with this funky shaped site? And so, again, a little bit closer to the water, the section to the water. Uh, there were so many hard things about this project, and I wanted to show it because I think it's a good example of how we um, think about these kind of Frankenstein hybrid typologies all in one building. In this case, three different unit types, um, but also how we deal in game code and zoning. Um, and so, and how do you make it into one building that feels like one cohesive architectural, you know, ambition? So what you're seeing here, if I explode it, there are two duplexes on the front. So those were obviously facing the water, the fancy ones. Two landlocked flats in the middle, least expensive, least desirable, one could argue. Um, but I think we made them really special, and they were much smaller footprints, so the buyer was you know, a different kind of buyer. And then we had these townhouse-type units, according to building code, because they were a three-story front door in the street, um, on the back that we m sold, marketed, thought of as a kind of new front, because there was a deep setback on the site that became their so-called front yard. So again, how do you like pull all this together as a building? And so. In terms of assembly, like how do you assemble these units? Um, you know, kind of thinking, not, you know, and our confin was so nice and tidy, <laughs> but this site not so much. Um, and then the other kind of wrench in the whole thing was that we were in an, a FEMA AE flood zone, which means you have to, you can't have a dwelling unit um, uh, lower than a certain base flood elevation, blah, blah, blah. So that red line is that base flood elevation, so we couldn't have any technically any um, living uh, units below. Luckily, the site had a natural slope up just enough, and we carved it a bit to accommodate what you're seeing right here, which is, again, to the left. In the orange are the two duplexes. The middle are the two flats. And then the light green on the right are the townhouses. These buildings with these, I know you were bummed out about developer projects. I get that. But you kind of, you got to kind of, um, you know, beat it at its own game. Mm -hmm. it, I love that you said you do the small scale and the big scale and you don't really understand the middle scale. Well, this is all about the middle scale. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, the, the problem with these small housing projects is there's no money for an elevator. And yet, code is um, that, and zoning, is that you have to, your first floor of dwelling, whether it's on ground or second floor, has to be accessible. So there are all these things that we couldn't afford an elevator. How do you have an accessible unit without an elevator? But townhouse type units are exempt from that, except for the front door. So we're gaming the FEMA flood elevation, we're gaming the whole accessibility requirement, and we're trying to build a building that, all, that doesn't um, require an elevator, 
and also trying to get away with only one means of egress. So this building did all that, but it was a kind of a hyper puzzle of these three different unit types gaming the section um, just as you see it here, which looks like no big deal, but it was really hard um, to make the dimensions work. So again, townhouse types in the back on the right, um, touching the ground, checking the box um, for those first floor units, just seeing the plan of the duplexes on the left, the middle flats, um, and then those the, uh, the gray flat in the middle, and you start to see the shape of the building that scallops in that diagonal, which was the shape of the site, which allowed just enough for that landlocked two units to get a view out to the water that kind of skirt the side of the front of the building. And then they all have roof decks, of course. So the figure of the building became this um, you know, single object that was trying to wrestle these three different unit types and make really great spaces to live, including the ones in the middle. And so the, that scissor move that you guys do so well in school because of glue, in reality, is incredibly inefficient because you have to, that zero crossover, you have to build the ceiling joist of the lower and the floor joist of the upper to pull that detail off. And so what we did is, if you look at the, um, the drawing there of the framing, the left side is lower than the right side. It looks like there are two flats that stack, but because it's a duplex, there's a demising wall that hides that discrepancy in section. And so it allowed us to have that detail provide these two duplex units where everything looked, you know, like it worked, which it did. Um, but we didn't have any redundancy or inefficiency with the structure. So we are always thinking in this way um, because the client's not going to pay for extra structure. They're not going to pay for that inefficiency. Um, and then the way that delta was reconciled was inside the duplex that had a few steps down. But Anyway, getting in the weeds, I can't help it. So here's a view of those scallop, um, the facade looking up that scallops out to provide a balcony and window from those center units back out to the water, which you can see how narrow that is. Right on the left, you see a little bit of the existing um, uh, uh, triple decker next to us kind of poking out with its gutter. So it's like a sliver. And then, you know, materially, you know, what corrugated metal is cheap. We love it. Um, but we always warm it with some wood, trying to think about just the idea of the verticals and the different scales of the vertical, the rail, and the corrugation, and the slats, and how that, you know, becomes a kind of um, co concise uh, wrapper for the whole building that's, you know, operating at many different levels. Um, and then, you know, you get a sense of the site and that slight slope on the right for the entry that made it all possible. Okay. All right, so um, this is a line from a currency song, um, and I think it just ties in nice to the next project, which I told you all I don't just do buildings, so you see something else this time. Um, this is a shotgun house in South Florida next to the Pantheon. Uh, I'm always trying to find interesting ways of sort of juxtaposing um, African-American history with sort of, sort of larger pedagogical questions of classicism and antiquities. Uh, and the great thing is, is Harvard paid for it. So this is what my real right research was about. So I feel like you guys had me talk. I should at least talk about something that y'all funded. Um, <laughs> so this is, so a lot of their work was around uh, North African contributions to classical architecture. Uh, and if for some reason I told Harvard I'm gonna design a column in the end, you know, so you gotta say big stuff to try to win these things. No idea if I was actually going to do it, but I feel like I can just say it and give me a better shot. So that's just an image of some standalone Corinthian order columns. Uh, started with a bunch of research. This is at the American Academy in Rome. Uh, the interesting thing about this is all the stuff I found on North Africa was in the anthropology department. Uh, the American Academy in Rome has one of the best libraries in the entire city, and all the stuff I needed to find were actually not in the architecture department. It was in anthropology and archaeology instead. Mm -hmm. So I spent all my time there learning as opposed to being in the actual architecture department. Um, start doing all these drawings and stuff, maps, timelines. Um, the cool thing about that paper is discarded paper that, they, that you use if you go get food at a restaurant. It's just literally like construction paper they put on the tables. Um, so it really just talked about crafts and labor. And uh, I convinced the people that work at the restaurant to give me massive packs of it. So everything I just started drawing, I started drawing on that paper instead. 
Um, in the end, it ended up in the Venice Biennale. Uh, it's still there now. Um, I got very lucky in that I am the very first project you see when you walk into Arsenale. So even if you hate it, you're gonna remember it because it's the first thing you see. Um, we made all these drawings. In the end, we made a nine foot tall column. And so these are some of the drawings, the drawings position, the column that we designed. And I say we because young Gabe right there, one of my assistants, uh, was a part of that. Um, and we positioned it within the Pantheon sort of as this sort of dystopic timeline of did people in the Pantheon steal from our column or did our column come to part of that? I don't know if you guys ever watch uh, sort of comic book movies and stuff, but in Transformers, they have, uh, they have Megatron inside of a spot and they're like operating on them and they use all the technology to get all the cell phones and stuff. I feel like this was my version of that. <laughs> um, the cool thing about it, in my opinion, is that we call it the columnar disorder and this is based off studies I've done when I was there in Italy. So the, instead of Corinthian, Ionic, and Doric, we have labor, identity, and migration which are things that deal with the African diaspora while I was there. Um, and so we made these artifacts or masks to also match those same things. And then because we know this is an architecture biennale, we made some plans and some sections just so people would get off my back. <laughs> uh, that's the column. It weighs 6,000 pounds. It's nine feet tall. It's carved out of Spanish Marquina marble. This is where the Harvard money came in because mm -hmm. I couldn't afford it. Um, and they positioned it right in between two existing columns that were there, which I thought was pretty awesome. And they have the greatest lighting designer of all time. Oh, it's this old yeah. Italian guy. He's like 75 years old. He rides a bicycle. He doesn't say any words. He just points. They change things and he rides off. It's very, <laughs> it's very whimsical, <laughs> but it's awesome. Gabe will tell you if I'm lying. That is absolutely what he does. <laughs> um, this is what the column looks like. Uh, the, it's literally one giant block. We, we hollowed out a 60 inch diameter uh, cylindrical core. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to handle the floor load. Um, they poured an entire slab just for me inside of that spot so we can actually um, hold it up. And it really was our way of trying to condense down hair, figures, texture, all down into one column. And I think the most important thing for us was how many classical rules could we break? So I like when I was going through the architecture books, it was all these, you have to have entablature, you can't do flooding, your proportions have to be this, you can't merge things. I looked, I said, all right, if I don't break every single rule, I was unsuccessful. Um, and so that became the idea behind columnar disorder, which is what this became. You can sort of see the texture, sorry, see the texture there and how we even got it down to make it seem like it's dreadlocks, literally cut within the piece itself. And this was all fabricated in Madison uh, by core stone because they do amazing stone work. Um, and then fun fact, September 2024, uh, I am the youngest to have a solo show at the Art Into Chicago where you see a bunch of this stuff. So Gabe, you ready to start working again because we got months and months of stuff to start doing things. Is this move in there? This is actually going to Art Oh My for two years. So it's off my hands after that. And then after that, somebody going to buy it. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's heavy. It's extremely heavy. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, okay, so so the present. Um, uh, in the end, uh, I, I, I actually did get pretty good at the uh, social processes and the various things involved in having to make the middle scale, um, but I was still really grumpy about it. Um, and so I decided to take a little bit of time off. Um, one of the things I did notice as I was going through this is that uh, working with data and learning how to tell stories about places and the invisible things in the world was a very, very powerful way to shape the, um, the DNA of buildings. Even the, the, the toughest um, developers were, were convinced by this. So I was like, well, maybe I'll, I'll take a bit of a break. And so I ended up going to the Media Lab at MIT um, and I worked within the social computing group there. Um, and in a way, um, almost, um, almost by accident, um, I mean, I, it's not completely by accident, but I, the first couple of projects were, um, they, they, they felt like they came out of nowhere. And so Supernormal kind of came into being as, as a way to come back into practice, but maybe to do it on, on different terms. Um, and to think um, about the, let's say, the, the, the infrastructures and the constructs and the, the power dynamics that were at play that were shaping the, the buildings in ways that I was not comfortable with. Um, so at any rate, super normal. I suppose that's where I am right now. That's my present. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that happened during the pandemic. Uh, uh, I, I realize now this was like, it was like in the dark days of the pandemic. That like, it was like January of 2021. It was really dark. And uh, we were working on an adaptive reuse building, a big project in the seaport, um, which actually Beth, 
I'm now realizing, I, did you work on 51 Sleeper at some point? Yes. I had, like, that just came <laughs> we to me. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, we'll talk about that, too. Um, so we were, we were doing a fit out, and uh, we also had to sort of magically create a uh, facade by keeping everything in the facade in place and yet remake it to come up to the level of the rest of the seaport, which was all, um, as you all have, have seen, the sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the buildings tend to look a bit the same in the seaport. And so I had the chance to do a lot of facade studies um, and, and, and think a lot about this. And at the same time, we were working on housing in Mattapan. Mattapan is an historically marginal community in Boston. Um, this is a, a community of historically black and immigrant uh, families and households, multi-generational households, lots of triple-deckers like Beth was talking about. Um, and so we were working in these two really, really different realms, and they felt so disconnected, um, and even more so because it was, it was the middle of the pandemic. So um, this was, in a way, this project, um, it, was a, it was a public art piece, and it, um, it became a way to kind of think about this and, and, and meditate a little bit on these things. So this is a facade study. These are the facades in the seaport. Um, they, they have sort of, you know, some smart things happening, a lot of very similar characteristics. Um, and and, and this, we happened to win the Boston Design Biennial at this point. Um, we were one of the, uh, the groups that, that won in 2020, 2021. One. And so we decided to use our award to, uh, uh, to to do a study, figure out what is the DNA of the facades, what is the DNA of the triple decker, can we use artificial intelligence and machine learning to see something that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see, to kind of understand something about these, and then, then actually, you know, create a project that is a criticism of the seaport. Um, why, why does it all have to be this way? Why does the disposition of the seaport have to be um, in, in a way so, so exclusive and, and it just, it, it didn't feel, it felt particularly challenging. And so we did, we, we, we ended up designing, um, or you know, this was the, this is like 2020 uh, neural nets, you know, this is like the, the early days. Um, and so this is a, it's a continuously becoming seaport facade, trained on all the seaport facades. And so it's, it's, it's continuously evolving. And we decided to, to uh, test out what it would be like if we put this continuously coming fragment of a seaport building in the seaport. Like we had like taken the corner of a building, and it's big, okay, this, it was a design build, so we actually built this thing as well. It's like a, like a corner of a building falls off and lands in the courtyard of one seaport. Um, and, and then we, we project onto it um, these, this facade that's, that's always changing. And so it was here. This sort of, I don't know, the whole, the whole thing was a little bit dystopian, to be honest with you. It was very dark. It was very... Was and it, here... Was it built? It was, oh, yeah, we built it. Like, we physically built that it. thing. Yeah. And we had to, like, hang out in the abandoned movie theater, that mm -hmm. King's movie theater. Yeah. And then there was an inflatable, because I'd been working with inflatables a ton. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was like a truly, um, it was truly absurd, but it was, like, so cathartic. <laughs> because all of those facades that felt like they were designing themselves were actually designing themselves here, you know? <laughs> um, and, and, and we ended up designing this... Um, and, and actually, the projection, by the way, projection is it was it was fascinating to to learn more about that. Um, and and we had two projectors set up, and these I mean it was it was the whole process was really remarkable. Um, and we ended up uh, designing a couple of inflatables as well to sort of witness this. Uh, this was building on work from 2016, 2017 that we'd done through um, some public processes, uh, and we we called it the sloucher. There's the sloucher. The sloucher would get very excited whenever people came near it because that was when no one was, you know, no one was, so, so the sloucher would, would light up and there was a sort of responsive element to this too. View from the, view, this was from the, uh, from the abandoned movie theater. The sloucher move? The sloucher like jiggles. <laughs> 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 the sloucher jiggles and like, it had motion sensors, so when people got near it, it would it would do things. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> All right, I was just told a, I had a slide that needed fixing that has been fixed. So I don't know. Tell me when to press go. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go. F well, I'm gonna go really. Fa we're gonna go fast. 
<laughs> I've been going fast. <laughs> I know. I keep saying that. I'm, I need to go faster. Um, okay, but I don't have slides yet. So future um, is a project. Oh boy. So go. Do you want me to cycle? Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. I don't have a clue what. Keep going. Brilliant. Oh, that's it. 107. You got it. So. Future project for us, this is um, kind of the future is now sort of project. Um, we are, it's another housing project. It's, it's in North Cambridge. It's on Mass Ave. And I think since this is a really interesting project for us to kind of pull together everything I've been talking about and doing for the last 15, 20 years um, into a site that is finally in the round. You know, I've been showing you these little slivers, seven units, nine units. This one is a lot bigger. Um, and it's a fascinating site because it is in the round and every single edge is radically different, has very different housing type scale, so on and so forth. Um, so there's a little glimpse, a little teaser. Uh, the site is here. Um, one edge is along Mass Ave, so it's kind of the whole Mass Ave thing. There's some mid-rises, bigger stuff. Um, it's a part of Mass Ave, northern Mass Ave, that's a little lonely. It's not as, it's not like here. Where am I? It's not like over there. But it, the ambition is there um, with the developer, of course, to create um, a place, um, but also there's a lot of parcels that are ripe for development. So I think it's, it's going to be a, a great area. It is a great area, but I think it's going to become much more densified, um, to use that word. And so the, it's flanked by Mass Ave, a street called Alberta Terrace, which has um, uh, triple deckers, <laughs> and then a street called Cedar Street, which has single family. So this was wild. Um, and then that little curvy bit is a street called Harvey that has kind of nothing. So this is our site. That's the building we're going to tear down um, if all goes well, that blue building. Um, it has retail on it. Here's some, some of the buildings that are on Mass Ave. Probably feels familiar to many. Triple Deckers on the Alberta Terrace Street that I just mentioned. To the left where that little chain link is, that's our site, which is now a parking lot with that little blue building and then some single family houses on Cedar. So we iterated like mad as we do in our office, um, trying to figure out what, what to do with a full block. So courtyard, is it two buildings? Is it one? Is it an L? Is it a U? You know, how do we deal with all these scales? There's, there's zoning regs where we could go high on mass, Ave, and we had to go lower, of course, the single family and all that. But we wanted to, we didn't want to do a bunch of different buildings, but we also, you know, weren't going to do just one solid block. There are, there are square footage requirements. We couldn't go over a certain square footage, so we did their open space requirements. So at the end of the day, or at least at the end of the day currently, we are here, like, thinking about these two chunks, creating this um, gap, this urban gap, which is the slice. They are, in fact, two different buildings. And that urban gap, if you've ever been to Bow Market in Somerville, the idea is that that bottom um, ground floor program will be mixed uh, retail and kind of pop-up shops. So there's a whole kind of mixed-use program, hybrid program um, thing going on with this project, which we're really excited about. And so, um, you know, here's the project. Uh, it is all of the above. It has triple deckers in it. It has single family pixels. It has duplex two-story pixels, and it goes up from there. This is the cedar side, which is the side where the single family houses are, so we're trying to obviously bring it down to that. But the way that it staggers in terraces um, creates all this amazing outdoor space for those unit owners. It also creates this really interesting street edge where the building is askew and there are these funky triangular setbacks along the sidewalk, which is rare. Um, and, and then edges like this, which is that the street I mentioned before that kind of had nothing across is sort of this sheer sectional cut. Um, and it, as we spin around, you see the gap and that kind of urban slice um, of public space. And then the Mass Ave is um, much more stoic and kind of predictable, a little bit in scale. We are starting to develop the nuances of the facade and the materiality um, to reference these datums of the triple deckers, which you see to the left. We're really looking into like giant corrugated shipping container scale metal for the envelope. 
Um, and then as you round the corner onto that triple decker side street, Alberta Terrace, we started to kind of try to figure out, I hate staggering buildings, <laughs> but somehow this project is all about that in a way that we are trying to create a kind of artful um, sort of combination of all these unit types into one cohesive whole. I mean, it's early, so we'll see where it goes, but you can see in this image the ambition to create that 35 foot height triple decker and then to divide up the massing so it reads like a series of buildings. I love this view and this one because it feels like a little city, um, but it is, again, trying to work with what we've got in terms of zoning envelope, height restrictions, dimensions we can't build taller than, and a square footage max that the developer is insistent on because that's where they make their money. Um, amazing client, understands the big idea of doing, trying to do something significant. Um, this is the urban gap, uh, and there are a few units that face into this space, and so on. So this is fun. This is how the floor plan is, um, you know, cascading down to the lower street on the left, which is the single family. Sectional shift, and that's it. Those are the three. Okay. All right. Um, that's a Kendrick Lamar line. Um, one of the things that I said earlier was that my position moves back and forth, so sort of started with this space between architecture and art installation moving into a space that's purely architecture and urbanism um, to then columns and sort of research trajectories. But all of it has one single thread and that's centering the African diaspora. So that means either the communities I work with or the clientele that I uh, am servicing or it's the actual things that make me happy as I'm doing the work. So I'm gonna show you a new project we're working on right now. Um, this is a single client in North, no, in South Florida, Delray Beach. Um, it's a collection of churches. They pull their resources together. They own some properties. We're doing a bunch of adaptive reuse. Uh, this is an existing, just generic house that they have in the neighborhood. It's a very boring, linear cottage. Um, we're gonna change it into sort of our version of a shotgun home, um, where it's gonna have more bathrooms. It's gonna be used as a community office space. Uh, so here is what it'll look on the inside, where you'll have some acoustical curtains as uh, sort of privacy for the meetings, and then a bunch of just typical plywood that we'll use to actually access shelving in the location. So again, single corridor, like the previous shotgun homes that were in the area. So you have sort of two different houses inside. So from one perspective, you see this very pristine location where we're trying to put art from local, local artists in the area, but from the other, other side, like you saw, right, you see all of the actual shelving and stuff in there. So that's would be one of them. Then across the street, there's this old parish hall. And the parish hall is currently where people have their baby showers, they have their wedding receptions, et cetera. We're gonna turn this into a commercial kitchen. So we're gonna slice a part of the building, push out the front, because one thing you learn about elderly populations and marginalized community, they want every single square foot. You cannot remove something and then not bring it back because they'll tell you why do we want to pay for that if you're taking stuff away. Um, so we cut away the building, but then we added more square footage. So the only reason we got this past them is by me saying I've actually made your building bigger than it was when we first started. Uh, so this is what the outside of the building actually looks like right now. This is what it's going to look like with the storefront. This is what it looks like with the slice along the side. We've already planted the entire farm already. We already have a bunch of trees already down. That first building I showed you, we're at the stage of uh, the MEP engineer sending us the drawings. That thing will go out to bid in about three weeks, and it'll probably start construction in January. Um, this one, we're in construction documents at the moment. It'll probably start middle of the year. This is what the inside is going to look like. The terrazzo floor is already existing, so we're just going to polish that up. The trusses above are already existing. We're just going to reveal those. It's an ugly drop ceiling that's above it, and we have to put in a brand new mechanical system on the inside. Then, across the street from there, there's another church, and, and with that church, they have this huge open lot, and elderly people really like parking. So one of the things they said to us is, <laughs> whatever you design, you better not take away our parking spaces. So uh, we came with this, there's a huge Bahamian community there. Uh, they're one of the ones that actually founded the neighborhood. It used to be a sundown town. If you don't know what a sundown town is, you should look that up. Um, 
we decided to come up with this massive Bahamian market. So it's this large shade structure that goes across the entire site. And we actually designed it based off the module of a parking stall. So that way everything can fit so we can have cars and parking kiosks there at the exact same time. So that way the elderly people can get off my back and the people in the neighborhood could actually do what they do, which is sell goods um, at a very small, at a very uh, big scale. So this is what the actual structure is going to look like. We have some photovoltaics on top. Each of those kiosks that you see, um, instead of using that ubiquitous white tent that we see all the time at farmer's market, it's like, why can't we design something based off of the Bahamian uh, community? And so these will be actually straw, uh, wood framed, well, metal framed with wood uh, accents to make it look like an actual Bahamian straw market that's there. But we had to make something that was resilient. And it's mobile, so it can actually dock underneath the shade structure will then be pulled out when necessary, pushed back when it's not necessary. Because three times, twice a month, they have huge farmer's markets. And so they'll use these kiosks there at those farmer's markets. And so you can see, this is what it'll look like as far as scale. And the color palette, because you know, it's a nod to the Bahamian community. This is from the blue from the Bahamian flag. So again, so this is sort of what we're working on at the moment. Um, this one, the structural drawings are already finished. Now we're just in the process of acquiring the land so we can do it. And then the actual framing for the kiosk we just waiting on the client to give us a thumbs up. The drawings are already done, so they can do that as well. Love that. Um, okay, so what am I doing next? Um, uh, it's very beginning of something that um, I haven't really shown yet, but actually I haven't shown any of this, which is exciting um, for me. Uh, so I, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I've been thinking a lot about what, um, what I want to do with this architecture thing, you know? And I, I, I think I'm interested in, in filling in the gaps and doing the things that are small but vast, that have an enormous amount of impact. Um, and so uh, we are right now um, doing something sort of strange, which is um, we, we're actually designing a financial product um, and uh, working with somebody and collaborating to design a mortgage and term sheets um, and some software. And we're designing a very small home uh, and piloting it with the city of Boston um, and writing some policy for it and um, hoping that it can fill in some gaps and really make a difference where it needs to. And also, frankly, um, provide a, a, a beautiful space for people and, and security in uncertain times. Um, so, so, so this is this is it. We're working. It's a it's a sort of a funny thing. I've been I've been working on these little units for a while. Things that have a, a kind of complicated mechanical core and then very simple parts that that go around it. So it's a hybrid assembly. And we're working right now to try to figure out whether we should do panelized or modular. I don't want it to be modular, but I think we might. I don't know. That's a whole other story. We can have a conversation about that if you want to. But it's it's a little thing, and it goes in it goes in backyards. I'm sure you all have heard of the accessory dwelling units and this is this is something like that um, and it looks like this you know it's a very smart sort of passive little home it's got some good energy efficiency things going on um, and, and and it's a way into for me it's a way into uh, <laughs> I don't know coping I guess with what I have talked about in the rest of the presentation um, or it, it's a way of sort of making sense of the environment uh, and and doing it in a way that I think is um, is really robust, actually, and it turns out though that it's it's not a it's not a simple thing. This this small little house, um, it's it's a it's not complicated, but it is complex. Um, architecture uh, is a social animal. You know, we deal with all of these infrastructures, uh, and so. We are at once uh, designing this this meaningful space. Uh, we are uh, we're we're trying to do it in a way that is very energy efficient, so that people's energy bills are reduced, and so they can also afford it by qualifying for subsidies. These are things that maybe planners would usually do, but frankly, this would never get built for middle income people, and certainly not lower to median income people if we didn't do it. So it's this sort of funny thing where I think by reaching up into the the, the infrastructure and the sort of systems level, I hope we're able to make better architecture and make it more meaningful and um, and and scalable um, for the for, for more places 
and it's doing other funny things. Um, I'm still trying to figure out this kind of way of, of interacting um, it, because it, it, you know, it is 2023 and it does deal with energy infrastructure and information and data um, as all of the things do in our lives right now. Um, but the smart home is such a painful idea. Maybe that'll be my next market-driven urbanism is the smart home. Um, it's a very painful idea for me. And I, I, I wonder, though, um, you know, how we can actually confront the real climatic imperatives of our time without dealing with this and really getting into the weeds. I don't think we can. So the question on my mind right now is how do we, how do we make it more human? Um, and how do we do that in a way that, that is, that's it's meaningful? So that is where I will land. So we have some time for questions, but I wanted to just say, I know that you, the, when, when I spoke with you right now, you, uh, before we started, you said you didn't actually, aside from planning the past, present, future organization, that you hadn't um, coordinated your talks. But I actually see like three very, to me, very clear themes that, uh, again, through the incredibly different work, but, but at the same time, seem to be woven together. And, Maybe the first one, again, which we really don't talk about too much in architecture school, but maybe we should talk about that more, is um, the first theme is the, is the question of trust. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it seems like whether it's trying to figure out uh, how to gain the trust of the developer, um, how to gain the trust of the community, in Jermaine's case, or even what happens if you lose trust in the client and what and, and how architecture will be affected, or the design field is affected by that. So it's really interesting because your past projects seem to to be connected uh, on this kind of baseline condition of trust. Um, the second theme seems to be that it, you are suggesting that we must know the order in order to subvert the order. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be about, again, a, in a way, gaming the system on the one hand and or recognizing and knowing enough about those those histories and narratives and other conditions in order to begin to manipulate them. Again, what, whether it's through codes or in Jermaine's case, through the question of the heritage of the column or in Elizabeth's case, through the question of, of, of owning the DNA of the seaport facades. So it's fascinating that you would, that that, that seemed to be tying together this your your your, uh, your second body of, of work that you shared, and then theme three might be about scaling and testing, um, and grappling with the complexity, taking opportunities, more opportunities than um, realizing where you can begin to maneuver and grab mo a little bit more opportunity each time. Um, so the projects are getting maybe bigger and more complex, dealing with with greater issues, whether they're at neighborhood scale or they're reaching up into, into other other uh, infrastructures that determine, like financing, that determine how things get built. Um, so I am like incredibly <laughs> impressed that these three, to me, the, the like it, again, despite the incredible difference in the work, t the, it hangs together so beautifully, probably on many other well levels that many of you all see as well. So I don't know if you wanted to, maybe that's just a statement on my part, but I'm, Curious to, to see if you if you see those themes as well. Yeah, I mean that's pretty good, Grace. How do you threaded this all together? Impressive. <laughs> I'm impressed. I would say on on your the topic of trust. Ah, you know, I always feel like if you're if you're just sincere, you know, that's all that's all you need, right? I think trust um, in terms of well. With this, the work that we do, we have to gain, gain the trust of the um, the neighborhood and all those people that literally are practically throwing chairs at me before I walk in the door. Like it, it is a tough crowd um, to come in and say you want however many units you want, which is seven times, or some would say three thousand times the density they want. So I think that that's a that's a weird thing you don't really talk about in school. So it's interesting that you brought. I don't think in all my years, I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about trust in architecture school. So that's cool, and that's a whole lecture in and of itself. But I do think there. I think it's a level of sincerity. It's also like you get to a point where you just 
there's certain things you know and certain things you don't. So there has to be a level of expertise and there also has to be a kind of confidence about all the stuff you don't know, right? And, and how you get it done. Um, I also say, well, anyway, trust, and then the, yes, invention on the norm. I mean, I love the columns, Jermaine. Like, that's just brilliant. Um, Thank you. And I think the way that I talked about that was a little more straight up in terms of, um, you know, a certain kind of building type and housing or unit type or whatever it might be. Um, and the scaling, well, that's the whole point of these position talks, I think, is to talk about whatever it is you're up to, how does it scale across X, Y, Z. And for some people, it's more like small, medium, big. And for others, it's like, you know, Biennale versus church rehab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which are not even close to the same. Um, that One, now, I mean, it makes sense why you're the director, right? If you were able to thread that together like that good. very simply. Um, the, the, the trusting is important. Like the last slide I had to say, uh, I am not your savior. Uh, that was in response to actually the first project because that community came to me because they saw that project and said, hey, can you do something similar in Delray Beach that you did in Opalaka? And I was like, y'all not the same neighborhood, so you, like, we can't do the same thing. It just doesn't make sense. You're not the same people. Um, and so we started doing that work. And then the toughest thing is when you have a bunch of elderly people who see you as like their grandson, they don't take you serious <laughs> at all. Like, they don't trust. Yeah, they don't trust it. I'll walk in and just like, oh, man, you know, you're so adorable. I'm like, nah, I'm an architect. And they're like, <laughs> so it's, it's, pro it's, it's, quite, it's quite problematic. Um, but in those, in those Try things. Try being a girl. Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is quite problematic, right? Um, but in those, in, in those same meetings, uh, part of it is just showing up because they expect people to not show up. Um, and so, like, I come to the community events. I go to the things that are not pay for off the budget, um, those types of things, just to show like I'm actually invested in this process. Um, and then ultimately, I just guilt trip them. In the end, I'm just like, mm -hmm. you all dealt with civil rights justice so that I can have a good future. <laughs> and, you, and you sent me to these neighborhoods with these uncomfortable people so that I can learn. And now you tell me I can't utilize all the stuff that I learned there? And then, they, and then they stop talking. Then they're like, all right, fine, kid, go ahead. And then we showed their project, and they're like, oh, I didn't know that was possible, right? So some of it is one way, it's also them being able to see there are alternative ways. And one of the things I try not to do is use terms like um, underprivileged or marginalized, because some, of the, some people of color are the most resilient people you'll ever meet. They make something out of nothing all the time. So instead, I prefer to say just under-resourced, because it's not their fault. But like, they really do kick ass on a regular basis. And so a lot of times what we do is try to make sure we just amplify the stuff that they do that they already do well, and just sort of add a different type of twist or lens to it. Um, and so again, going back to that positionality of not having a singular term define what we do, but more so how do we maneuver within these spaces and contract and push and pull. You bring the resource. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the trust thing is so interesting. And I, I, to me, it also is about this question of like transparency or uh, opacity um, in, in communities, between in relationships with communities, with clients, uh, but also with, let's say, governments and banks and institutions. And so much of the stuff that we deal with is really opaque. Like, why are the building codes the way the building codes are? Like, what the hell is up with that two means of egress situation? Well, to be Life honest, safety. and sexism <laughs> and all kinds of other stuff, yes. you know? A lot of there is a reason that things are the way they are, you know? And, and, and Grace, to your point, until we really dig underneath and, and daylight not only the rules of the game, but why the rules are as they are, what the value systems are that are driving those rules, it's really hard, I think, to make substantive change. Um, so I I think it's about both learning the system, but then also understanding what architecture can do to dismantle or fray at the edges so that we can make that really lasting change. So I think it's it's about building trust, but it's also about, um, you know, recognizing w when we should be mistrustful and doing something about it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of for me I like as that. well. Yeah. Be skeptical. I think liability and fear is killing the... It's the hardest thing in the profession. You ain't never lied about that one. I know we're running short on time, but I'd love to, in my questions. Who's the brave soul? <laughs> ah, there he is. 
Thank you guys so much. Um, so I noticed Grace was trying to wrap you guys all together. I'm wondering how you guys might be different, how you guys might disagree. Is there any th anything, a, an uncommon thread, something mm. that you guys are diverging upon that you think is different from the others? You're smiling really hard. Like, <laughs> you just know something's coming. Um, Gabe has heard me say this before. Some of my other close friends have heard me say before. I'm going to just say this in a place where this is probably blasphemy. I don't care about buildings. <laughs> I, I honestly don't. And I do. I do. <laughs> I, do not, I do not care about buildings. Um, I like to call myself an architectural anthropologist because I care more about the rituals of space than the tectonics of space. The tectonics of space are just a vehicle for us to do the things that we find joy in. I just happen to be good at drawing them. So I do that so that we can get to the actual ritualistic components as well. That never goes over well when I tell other architects, like, I, oh, cool, man, you got a really nice building. I like it for like five minutes, and then I'm on to the next thing, and then <laughs> moving on. And that never goes over well at all. But that is probably something where I diverge in that I love this profession. I've only ever wanted to be an architect for my entire life, but I have never had an obsession with buildings, which is really odd, but it's, but it's the truth. I think there are more architects, architects that are not interested in buildings. I have a friend who has been teaching in Columbia for a long time, and she said to me a few weeks ago, I don't know if I can, it's hard to teach her now because nobody's interested in buildings. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I think that's kind of true. It's not totally true. But I think that's all fine. I yeah. think, I mean, we need buildings. I happen to be obsessed with buildings. And I think it's so fascinating to try and figure out how to put a building together that does mm -hmm. all these things it has to do. So it's it, the, maybe it's some kind of masochistic endeavor to figure it all out, but I enjoy it. But I also think it's important. We need them. We need buildings. Mm -hmm. But we also need this dialogue. And so I think it's wonderful that the discipline and discussion and pedagogy of architecture is any and everything. Um, and that it's up to all of us to discuss how it's relevant or not to the what's at stake and whatever that is changes too. So I think, I mean, I, I like, I think this trio is kind of amazing, Grace. Um, it's and you're totally at, weird. You're good at buildings, so I can, I can see why you like them. <laughs> Thank you. And you're good at not buildings. Yeah. <laughs> but I like, but that, but that architectural stuff at the end was pretty good. I know you don't want it to be, but it is. That was is. a funny, look, <laughs> I'll really tell you all good. behind the scenes. So <laughs> Beth goes, Jermaine, I was looking at some of your work. You're probably not going to show a building, are you? And I was like, actually, <laughs> I do have buildings in there that I'm actually going to show. Because I figured people don't want to see cars from Lexus. They think they wanted to see a building instead. Do, do we want? I have a very quick question, yeah, if there's time. Okay, if yeah, no, uh, yeah, and, you, and you will conclude. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I, I just, I'm really thankful and have learned a lot about, uh, and thankful that you sort of taught students about different paths to success. There's like no one right path. We feel like all of you demonstrate like an agility to taking advantage of scarcity or just the circumstances that you were dealt with. And I wonder if you could speak at, sort of as a learning lesson of starting up. Um, you know, how, how, how do you build on uh, what you get and what was useful and productive and what strategies were useful uh, mm -hmm. in sort of figuring out your circumstances and figuring out a path? Yeah, that's such a good question, Anne Maria. Um, no, I, I think it's so true. Like, your position comes from your, the conditions that, that you, you're given. I mean, that's what it is, you know? Um, and um, there's, the world is full of so many interesting and wonderful things. Um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I, I got into architecture because of art, and here I am redesigning code. You know, I, it, it's a little crazy, but, but you just, it's, I, I think you find that thread, and you start to pull it, and suddenly, you know, there's this, there's this, there's this sweater that you've created, you know, um, uh, you know, that, that, that is this whole, this whole world. So I think it's about just kind of finding that thread and pulling it and, and sort of staying with it. Um, I will say, like, architecture is hard right now. Um, I think it's really hard. I cannot, I, I, I want everyone in this room, I wish everyone was still here to understand and appreciate how amazing Beth's practice is. Mm. She has built like almost the impossible. It, it's, it's almost impossible what she did. Um, I really, I feel that way. It's just yeah, incredible. It, it has just about killed me though. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody <laughs> to be totally honest. 
<laughs> it's really, in many ways. really hard. It's really, really, it's really hard. Really hard. <laughs> and if you are a woman, if uh, people are skeptical of you, if you have children, um, if you are not independently wealthy, these are things that are make it even harder. Um, but I think that finding that thing and then and then then chasing it and, and having confidence in it um, and and having the belief too that like you can you can change things. I think this is I don't know. I think it's super important. Um, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna steal some of Beth's words earlier when she. I don't know if she was intentionally or unintentionally when she kept saying, you know, we were breaking rules, breaking rules. We were hacking things and breaking rules. And um, I think what I would say to you all is there has to be a certain bravery in the approach because most times people create rules and structures because that's what they're comfortable with and they're not comfortable in the uncomfortable. Like, you all have to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Like, architecture is naturally risk averse. Hmm. Everything's about liability and how do you avoid getting sued. That's why we have to have so much goddamn insurance so that you don't get sued, right? But I think what you saw in Best Projects was that you have to sort of eschew that fear and you just start working and if somebody catches you, then you confront it, but until then you keep on doing it. That's how you get the really cool stuff. <laughs> um, I think what you saw out of Elizabeth's project was a lot of the same, right? It was, all right, you know what? We don't like this process. We'll just write a new process. And you always have to be willing to write that new process. Um, I know for me, it was I never mm -hmm. wanted to be seen as a single thing because I have way more interest than just one thing. So I'm going to create a practice that does everything. And to me, it's extremely traditional, even though it seems like it's, it's untraditional. Like architects historically designed everything from the doorknob through the entire building and nobody bat an eyelash. Nowadays, we can't do anything without being afraid of being sued. So I'm like, well, why can't I go back to designing chairs, doorknobs, tables, et cetera, as well as a building and, and still have a successful practice? Um, it's luckily worked for me because it's just not a lot of black architects. So when it's not a lot, I get pushed to the line a lot faster than many others. I'm aware of that privilege. Um, and it's just something that I try to push forward because I am aware of that privilege. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be really fast because I know you guys want to go. But um, the trajectory is interesting. I mean, there is a, don't, don't get me wrong, I mean, I, I'm stressed all the time. I'd sleep like four or five hours a night. But there, the, you have to. There is also a kind of, um, not to get too personal, but a lightheartedness you have to have about all of this. Otherwise, you won't be able to get out of bed. <laughs> it's really dangerous what we do. The liability is huge. The stakes get bigger and bigger, um, and there's so much in uncertainty. So I would, I would just say that. There's that, like just realizing life is but a play and a lightheartedness, even when it's so dire, is so important and a kind of, in a kind of, back to the word trust, like it's all going to be fine, <laughs> even when it's not. Um, and the other is uh, in terms of scaling up or whatever we're going to call it, moving to the next thing, you, you max out and milk whatever you just did as much as you can to get the next thing. You were always, I can't tell you the incredible projects we've gotten that we did not deserve to get because we weren't there yet, we weren't there yet. But the sincerity about what we were up to and the kind of um, discussion about how we could pull it off, and we didn't win everything, of course not, but the ones that we did, it was really about that. So I would just say, just, you know, it's it's a kind of a push 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 discipline, um, which sounds negative, but it's sort of like, okay, now what now what can we do? Okay, so we figured out the tube type, the column, whatever it is. Um, how can we improve on it? And every gener that's what it is. That's what architecture is, and every profession is. You're improving on the last generation, so you're taking the type and you're trying to innovate on it and innovate on it and innovate on it <laughs> till the end of time. That's sort of the point. Um, and it is. Scary but fabulous, so anyway, thank you. Thank you.